Welcome to the Radiographics Podcast. I'm Wendy Gibbs, and I'm joined by my co-host, Ross Frederick, to bring you the latest valuable educational material from our journal. This week, Dr. Frederick is summarizing an article describing a life-threatening diagnosis that I don't think we learned about in our residency training, spontaneous coronary artery dissection. A few months ago, I started seeing this diagnosis as an indication for evaluation of the carotid arteries on my neck CT angiograms. So even though I'm not a cardiac imager, it was vital that I learn more about it, and Dr. Frederick helped me out with that. Although spontaneous coronary artery dissection was previously considered a rare diagnosis, it's more common than we thought. Timely and precise identification of a spontaneous coronary artery dissection will expedite care and prevent serious complications such as sudden cardiac death and extensive myocardial infarction leading to heart failure. A high level of suspicion is needed for this diagnosis, which should be considered in the setting of acute chest pain in patients with low risk of coronary artery disease, particularly young and middle-aged women and pregnant or postpartum patients. After the diagnosis is established, patients should be assessed for systemic diseases that are associated with SCAD, such as fibromuscular dysplasia and other systemic vasculopathies. So let's have Dr. Frederick start with this one. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection, an underdiagnosed clinical entity, a primer for cardiac imagers. Spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which I will refer to as SCAD, is an increasingly recognized non-traumatic, non-atherosclerotic cause of acute coronary syndrome that results in myocardial infarction and sudden cardiac death. 90% of patients with SCAD are young females and women between the ages of 47 and 53 years, which I find to be strikingly specific demographic. This disorder accounts for the highest prevalence of peripartum myocardial infarctions. The diagnosis and management of this condition, which previously was described in only a few case reports, has evolved significantly during the past decade, and SCAD is no longer considered a rare event. This is primarily because of the heightened awareness of SCAD in younger, healthy females who do not have traditional risk factors for coronary artery disease, and the increasingly recognized invasive angiographic appearance of SCAD, along with adjunctive intravascular coronary imaging performed in challenging cases. Despite the increased prevalence and heightened awareness of SCAD, the diagnosis of this condition remains a challenge. Invasive coronary angiography is the primary imaging modality for the diagnosis and management of SCAD. In hemodynamically unstable patients, or those with ongoing reduced myocardial perfusion, intervention may be indicated at the time of angiography. Because percutaneous coronary intervention may be associated with a higher complication rate in individuals with SCAD, the majority of patients who are hemodynamically stable and non-high-risk SCAD patients are managed conservatively. Therefore, coronary CTA has the potential to have an increasingly important role in the surveillance and diagnosis of recurrent SCAD and in situations in which invasive angiography results are non-diagnostic. This article provides an overview of SCAD and covers the diagnostic imaging features of this disease at coronary CTA in correlation with invasive coronary angiography findings as well as surveillance and management of SCAD. SCAD is defined as spontaneous hematoma formation that is not atherosclerotic, post-traumatic, or iatrogenic and results in separation of the arterial wall, which can occur between any of the three arterial wall layers, but most often occurs within the medial layer. So who gets SCAD? Fibromuscular dysplasia is the most common arteriopathy associated with SCAD, and is reported in about three-fourths of patients with SCAD, which has a female-to-male ratio of 9 to 1. The underlying mechanism of fibromuscular dysplasia involves fibrodysplasia and disorganization of smooth muscle cells, fibroblasts, and connective tissue matrix. Multifocal fibromuscular dysplasia appears as the pathognomonic string of beads on angiograms due to alternating stenoses and intervening mural dilatations. Arterial aneurysms and dissections also occur in a subset of individuals with fibromuscular dysplasia. The most common findings observed at invasive coronary angiography in cases of suspected coronary fibromuscular dysplasia are coronary tortuosity and ectasia or dilatation. 
Pregnancy-related SCAD accounts for fewer than 5% of cases with an increased incidence in multiparous women. These patients have a more severe clinical presentation and have a worse prognosis. Inherited arteriopathies and connective tissue disorders are infrequently reported as the underlying cause of SCAD. These include Marfan, Ehlers-Danlos, and Lois-Dietz syndrome. The most common precipitating factors for SCAD are extreme emotional distress and physical stress. The stress catecholamine surge during these episodes is the driving mechanism that leads to coronary artery shear stress, which can cause intimal rupture or disruption of the vasovasorum. The majority of patients present with symptoms of acute coronary syndrome. Chest discomfort or pain that results from compromised flow due to false lumen compression on the true lumen is by far the most common symptom at presentation, followed by ventricular arrhythmia and cardiac arrest. Now what is the role of coronary CTA in diagnosing SCAD? Coronary CTA is a readily available imaging tool that facilitates rapid evaluation of the coronary arteries and is excellent for evaluating the coronary and cardiac anatomy. Its major weakness lies in evaluation of small distal coronary arteries, which can be challenging and beyond the resolution of current CT scanners. Coronary CTA is increasingly being used for non-invasive diagnosis in appropriate patient groups to offset iatrogenic complications of invasive coronary angiography owing to concern regarding iatrogenic propagation of dissection. An additional benefit of CT is the capability to evaluate the vessel wall and diagnose intramural hematoma, which is better appreciated on orthogonal cross-sectional views. Thus, it is extremely important to assess the coronary arteries in multiple reformatted planes, which display the vessels for adequate assessment of the mid to distal coronary arteries, where SCAD can be easily missed. Primary coronary features related to SCAD from most common to least common are abrupt luminal stenosis, intramural hematoma, which is defined as vessel wall thickening, tapered luminal stenosis, and dissection, which is identified as linear hypoattenuation extending between contrast material filled false and true lumens. Secondary findings that increase our confidence and aid in the diagnosis of SCAD include epicardial and perivascular fat stranding ill-defined high attenuation adjacent to the coronary artery on non-contrast CT images, coronary tortuosity, myocardial hypoperfusion, myocardial bridging, absence of coronary calcifications, and vessel occlusion with absent distal flow. SCAD can be categorized based on the SAW classification system. Type 1 manifests as multiple lumens with dissection flap. Type 2 the most common type manifests as abrupt tapering and long luminal stenosis due to intramural hematoma. Type 3 manifests as focal short segment severe stenosis. Certain artifacts and disease entities seen at coronary CTA have the potential to mimic SCAD. Coronary vasospasm can cause diffuse or focal luminal narrowing, which mimics type 2 SCAD on invasive coronary angiograms and is often difficult to differentiate on coronary CTA without ancillary findings of perivascular haziness and intramural hematoma on non-contrast images. Acute coronary artery embolus, or thrombus, can cause abrupt luminal occlusion and can be mistaken for SCAD. Respiratory motion or heart rate variability, which results in stair step or cardiac pulsation artifact, can blur the vessel and the surrounding perivascular fat and mimic a dissection flap or intramural hematoma-related stenosis and potentially be misinterpreted as SCAD. So when is a coronary CTA the way to go? The current role of this examination is predominantly in the evaluation of patients with stable SCAD who may have had recurrent symptoms or when invasive angiography results are inconclusive. It can also help exclude alternative diagnoses. Given the dominant association of SCAD with fibromuscular dysplasia, it is important for all patients with a diagnosis of SCAD to undergo surveillance imaging with CT or MR angiography from the head to the pelvis to rule out underlying arteriopathy. Fibromuscular dysplasia most frequently affects the renal, 
carotid, and vertebral arteries, but it can involve any artery. Treatment for SCAD can be categorized as acute management or long-term surveillance. This topic has recently been reviewed extensively. Acute management varies on the basis of the hemodynamic status and presence or absence of signs of ischemia. Conservative medical management is preferred for hemodynamically stable patients. No current practice guidelines exist for coronary CTA surveillance of patients with SCAD on a long-term basis. Patients typically have an excellent long-term prognosis after initial SCAD, with 83% of known SCAD cases having no residual signs of dissection, suggesting good healing in the majority of patients. Now, what are the limitations of coronary CTA? The diagnosis of SCAD in distal coronary arteries is challenging with coronary CTA because of low spatial resolution. Also, non-calcified atherosclerotic plaque at coronary CTA can be mistaken for intramural hematoma, or vice versa, especially when the plaque involves a short segment. Therefore, catheter-based invasive coronary angiography is the reference standard for assessing suspected SCAD. Let's recap a few key points. The role of CT in the diagnosis of SCAD has not been completely established. However, this imaging examination is becoming increasingly used for non-invasive diagnosis in appropriate patient groups to offset iatrogenic complications of invasive coronary angiography, owing to concerns regarding iatrogenic propagation of dissection. An additional benefit of CT is the capability to evaluate the vessel wall and diagnose intramural hematoma, which is best appreciated on orthogonal cross-sectional views. SCAD has an increased prevalence in the mid to distal coronary arteries, and given the lower spatial resolution of these small vessels at coronary CTA, the current role of this examination is predominantly in the evaluation of patients with stable SCAD who may have recurrent symptoms. Given the dominant association of SCAD with fibromuscular dysplasia, it is important for all patients with a diagnosis of SCAD to undergo surveillance imaging with CTA or MRA from the head to the pelvis to rule out underlying arteriopathy. Great, very interesting and important. Okay, for my article, I'm going to summarize an article that describes the complexity of PET in differentiating malignant and benign skeletal tumors and some of the important mimics and pitfalls. This also has come up for me lately in some of my spine cases, so this article was very useful. Common Skeletal Neoplasms and Non-Neoplastic Lesions at 18 FDG PET CT. PET is invaluable in the evaluation, staging, and surveillance of cancer, but it can be tough. Primary tumors, metastases, and a number of different incidental lesions can have substantial FDG avidity. So this is especially difficult in patients with known cancer who have an avid lesion somewhere that you might not expect. In this article, the authors describe the variability in FDG uptake in malignant tumors and benign tumors. They emphasize the importance of morphologic evaluation on the CT part and discuss non-neoplastic lesions that are FDG avid and shouldn't be mistaken for tumor. We know that malignant lesions tend to have more FDG uptake than benign lesions. But for primary osseous lesions, we can't use FDG uptake to determine whether something is benign or exclude malignancy. For example, benign chondroid lesions such as enchondromas typically show low-grade FDG uptake, while higher-grade chondrosarcomas are more FDG avid. And this pattern of uptake can be useful to distinguish high-grade and low-grade lesions of the same histologic subtype, which can be challenging with anatomic imaging alone. But many benign lesions also demonstrate extremely high FDG uptake. Giant cell tumors, for example, can be very FDG avid with a maximum standardized uptake value greater than that of chondrosarcomas. Other benign lesions like osteoidosteomas, non-ossifying fibromas, and aneurysmal bone cysts can demonstrate high enough uptake to be confused with malignant lesions. This is further complicated by the tendency of some malignant lesions to show low FDG uptake such as low-grade osteosarcomas and Ewing sarcomas. Another benign entity that can be very FDG avid is osteomyelitis. And also very important, multiple myeloma and metastases can have variable uptake, high or low. 
The variability of FGG uptake in intraosseous lesions limits the utility of FTG PET as a standalone modality for prediction of malignant potential. However, the combination of clinical history, other available imaging, and evaluation of the morphologic characteristics of the tumor on the CT part, FTG PET CT can be useful in the generation of a focused differential diagnosis. Multiple myeloma is a monoclonal plasma cell gammopathy that arises from red marrow and accounts for approximately 10% of all hematologic malignancies. It's the most common primary osseous malignancy in adults aged 40 to 80. FTG PET CT is recommended by the International Myeloma Working Group for diagnosis and treatment response of multiple myeloma to differentiate metabolically active lesions with high FTG uptake from treated lesions, so low FTG uptake compared with that on the pretreatment imaging. The changes in FTG avidity occur earlier than the structural changes that can be seen on anatomic imaging. In addition, PET-CT provides prognostic information. The presence of three focal active lesions, extramedullary disease, and an SUV max of greater than 4.2 are related to poor prognosis. On PET-CT, focal, diffuse, or mixed patterns of FTG uptake may be seen. These areas of uptake may or may not correlate with lytic lesions on corresponding CT. The CT component of FTG PET is limited for evaluation of smoldering multiple myeloma and monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance because there are no lytic lesions with these diseases. However, the IMWG recommends the use of FTG PET CT to distinguish multiple myeloma from smoldering multiple myeloma if whole body MRI is not available. In patients who have smoldering myeloma, lesions with FTG uptake but without corresponding osteolysis have a shortened time to progression to multiple myeloma. On CT, myeloma shows lytic lesions with endosteal scalloping, mottled areas of marrow, and focal or diffuse marrow infiltration. In addition, CT allows detection of extramedullary lesions. All right, how about metastases? Osseous metastases are much more common than primary bone tumors and are the third most common site of metastatic disease. Bone metastases are strongly associated with decreased survival rates. Radiographs have limited value for detection of osseous metastases because a structural change of at least 50% is required to be detected on x-ray. The sensitivity of technetium-99 MDP scintigraphy requires new bone formation and remodeling in response to osseous metastases. Therefore, the utility of that modality is limited to osteoblastic METs. The intensity of FDG uptake in bone METs is related to the avidity of the primary tumor as well as tumor size. In a primary tumor with increased uptake, the sensitivity of FDG PET CT can be as high as 98%, with diagnostic performance superior to that of CT. Bone metastases can also have low FDG avidity, such as sclerotic METs, low grade lymphoma, and well-differentiated thyroid carcinoma. Sclerotic metastases such as prostate and breast may not be visible on FDG PET, reflecting the inherent differences in the metabolic activity of individual tumors or the presence of a smaller volume of malignant cells in osteoblastic METs. Osseous METs from lung adenocarcinoma typically demonstrate higher FDG uptake. However, adenocarcinoma with a lipidic growth pattern, previously called bronchoalveolar cell lung cancer, demonstrates significantly lower FDG avidity, so maybe an SUV of 3.9, relative to that of other histologic subtypes, which are usually an SUV of 8 to 12. FDG PET-CT is highly sensitive for both Hodgkin and high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma. However, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma, such as follicular lymphoma, small cell lymphocytic or chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and mucosa-associated lymphoma, are not reliably FDG avid. All right, so what about some of the other FDG avid lesions we see that aren't tumor? FDG uptake related to osteoarthritis and inflammatory arthropathy correlates with a degree of synovitis in inflammation. The pattern and distribution of uptake in large joints may suggest specific clinical entities. Diffuse joint uptake is usually associated with osteoarthritis. Once diffuse uptake is established, the presence of joint space narrowing, osteophyte formation, subchondral cystic or sclerotic changes, and interarticular bodies seen on the CT portion support this diagnosis. Inflammatory arthropathy most commonly shows synovial thickening, but periarticular erosions, periostitis, 
periarticular demineralization, and joint space narrowing is also seen. FDG PET CT is highly sensitive and specific for the detection of acute and subacute osteomyelitis and is useful in patients with chronic osteomyelitis. Increased uptake in inflammatory processes is related to the increased number and expression of glucose transporters in active inflammatory cells. Although FDG accumulates in areas of infection, uptake is nonspecific and can be seen with aseptic inflammation. FDG PET-CT is useful in the evaluation of spine discitis osteomyelitis as an adjunct to MRI. Discitis osteomyelitis shows erosive or destructive changes of the end plates, subcortical sclerosis or demineralization, and loss of disc space height on the CT portion. In patients with diabetic osteomyelitis, soft tissue findings include ulceration, emphysema, and abscess, with adjacent osseous changes including a periosteal reaction, cortical erosions, and occasionally interosseous emphysema. Varied reports are encountered regarding the diagnostic performance of FTG PET-CT in the evaluation of patients with diabetic osteomyelitis, Charcot joint, and septic arthritis, which emphasizes the importance of the CT portion for these entities. Aseptic loosening, the most common cause of a failed joint prosthesis, is related to micromotion of the prosthesis or inflammatory reaction to the hardware which results in recruitment of inflammatory cells and FDG uptake on PET-CT. Infection is a less common cause of prosthetic failure, which results in a neutrophil-predominant inflammatory reaction and FDG uptake. Differentiating aseptic loosening and prosthetic infection is clinically significant because the treatments for these two entities are vastly different. Variable findings are reported regarding the location of radiotracer uptake around the prosthesis and the degree of FDG uptake for prosthetic infection. Thus, CT, again, has an important role in differentiating the two. Osteolysis seen with infection is typically ill-defined and aggressive. Infected fluid collections have irregular walls, adjacent fat stranding, or a skin sinus tract. A periosteal reaction is more commonly seen with periprosthetic infection. Because of similar findings and patient clinical presentation, Correlation with serum white blood cell count and joint fluid analysis may be required. However, in cases of a suspected infection, a PET-CT exam that is negative for abnormalities eliminates the need for revision surgery. So there's much to think about here. I always thought PET could solve all of our hard questions that we couldn't figure out with just CT or MRI alone. But this proves that we really need every modality and approach we can get sometimes. And it's important for us to be familiar with findings on different modalities even if it isn't in our own subspecialty, so we can make the correct recommendations for additional imaging and better understand the findings and how they fit into the big picture. All right, that's it for this week's podcast. We'll be back in two weeks with more summaries and some of the new stuff that we announced at RSNA. In the meantime, take a look at the website for these articles and their beautiful images. Mm-hmm.